part of them again. Uh, we begin with the name of God, with which Muslims and traditional Christians always begin everything. But everything begins with Him and ends with Him. Uh, I was invited to give the beautiful uh, memorial lecture uh, at this wonderful seminary where I first lectured over 40 years ago, which I know well. I was very glad to accept because this was a man of great honor and scholarship who made the greatest contributions really to Muslim Christian understanding. I always held him in the best respect. And after this institution began as a missionary school to get rid of Islam, with people like Zwemer and so forth, it transformed itself into one of the major centers for the understanding of Islam. And it has remained so thanks to his efforts, to that of Dr. James Smith, my dear friend, a number of other scholars, Ibrahim Abu Rabi, who died recently, unfortunately, and many others who contributed over the years, and now Prof. Mahmoud Ayyub, spending the last part of his scholarly career in this seminary. I wish them all well, and I think they know better than anybody else how important the task of creating better understanding between Islam and Christianity is for both Muslim and Christians, non-Muslims and non-Christians, and those who don't believe in anything, it's important for all of humanity. Uh, when I was asked to deliver this lecture on purpose, I chose a rather wide theme. I remember when I was a student at Harvard, there was a very great German Orientalist called Helmut Ritter. And they said he was writing his last great masterpiece uh, of Islamic studies that are written major works on Sufism and Shrav and Islamic philosophy and so we were all awaiting it. And the book came out, a voluminous book that only Germans could write, a thousand pages, about two sentences in Arabic. How to interpret these two sentences? About trivia, really, trivia. I thought that um, I reached a stage of my life when instead of giving a lecture on a single sentence of Mullah Sadra or Sora Ardi, which I've done for many, many years, to now turn out to over 50 years of study, meditation, work and travel and meeting of people to speak about some larger themes which bring together the remarkable opportunities which God has provided in my life to study not only Islam but other religions on many different levels. And so I chose a subject which is very, very difficult to speak of that is Sunnism and Shiism, and not only today, but yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and to bring out something of the significance of the subject for our world today. <coughs> Let me begin by uh, just a few definitions, because the audience here is comprised of both well-known scholars and advanced students, and those who perhaps who do not know much about the subject, but every morning they open up the New York Times, the word Sunnism and Shiism appear somewhere, and somebody has put a bomb to kill a few Shiites in Pakistan, and the next day somebody put a bomb to kill a few Sunnis. So at least they've heard of these terms, although in very unfortunate circumstances. Uh, not only perhaps are aware where these two words come from. They reveal very much the context of, of the perspective that each follows within the totality of Islamic orthodoxy, and I use that term carefully. Uh, the word Sunnism, of course, means those who follow the tradition of the Prophet, and the Sunnah wa Jama'ah in Arabic. And the word Shiism means those who are the partisans of the last of the part of the sentence dropped as Shi'ata Ali, that is, those who are, who are partisans of Ali, a term which the Prophet himself used in his own lifetime to a number of the Sahaba who were very close associates of Ali. So both Sunnism and Shiism go back to the origin of Islam in their terminology, but they were not used in this way until a century or two later. That is, you did not meet in the streets of Medina while the Prophet of Islam, Islam was walking around, and some people say, I'm a Sunni, and other people say, I'm a Shia. Essentially, it did not exist. But the reality of it had crystallized into these two different aspects of Islam had its roots, actually, in the Quranic revelation and in the inner being of the Prophet himself. In the inner being of the Prophet himself, there were already, you might say, the spiritual roots of an Abu Bakr and an Omar, of an Ali and a Fatima. They were all within the soul of the Prophet in one way or another, and they manifested themselves as his 
most important companions or family and so forth. So the term is not a new term and should not be confused with Catholicism and Protestantism. Protestantism came 1500 years after the foundation of Christianity. And Shiism did not come 1500 years or even five years after. Sunnism and Shiism began together from the cradle and origin of the Islamic revelation. Secondly, Shiism has always remained a minority religion, reflecting the very moment of the death of the Prophet. That is, when the Prophet died, the great majority of the community went to wash and bury him uh, in the mosque, which is now be threatened by the Saudi Arabian government to be destroyed. Let's hope that they don't make fools of themselves any more than they have, and this doesn't happen. I'm taking every opportunity possible as a Muslim. I feel I can't sleep at night. The things I've read that might be happening to the tomb of the Prophet and the mosque of the Prophet in Medina. Let's solve it, solve the koshmar of the French say, a terrible nightmare. We shall see, we shall see. But anyway, while they were busy trying to bury him there, a small number, a very small number of people uh, assembled around Ali. And the numbers were not ever the same. Uh, especially the people went then to the hall where there was the first shawra, first uh, meeting of uh, Muslims to decide who should succeed uh, the Prophet. And Ali and a few people of the family remained to finish the burial uh, ceremony and therefore did not participate in that very, very important event which determined everything later on in Islamic history to our own day practically. So, Shiism will always remain a minority religion. And to this day, there are about 15% of Muslims who are Shiites, 85% are Sunnis. And Sunnism is the largest single minority, of, a majority of any religion in the world. That's a very, very important fact. To understand Islam, you must understand that. But if you take uh, Buddhism, uh, Christianity, Hinduism, and you talk about the major interpretations, let's say Vajrayana, Mahayana, Theravada schools of Buddhism, or Catholicism, Protestantism, Orthodoxy, or talk about uh, Shivite and Vishnavite and Vajrayana, Hinduism, there's no single school that has such a large majority domination numerically. As Sunni Islam as in, in Islam. And yet, and yet, if you look at the central lands of Islam, that is from Egypt to the Punjab, in that land there's much greater equity, although not majority, of, between Sunnis and Shiites, and the two have played a very important dynamic uh, duo, you might say, role throughout Islamic history. It's also very important to realize that. Uh, Sunnism and Shiism are not static divisions within Islam. I always give this example. The city of Tripoli, where there was fighting just yesterday, just yesterday, uh, many of you were killed in northern Lebanon, in what the Europeans call the Middle Ages, uh, was a Shiite center, whereas today it's a completely Sunni center. The coming of the Crusaders, the defeat of the Muslims in the hand of the Crusaders, in many countries such as uh, Syria and what is today Jordan and Palestine and so forth, changed also allegiances from seven Imam Ismailism to Sunnism and vice versa. Many uh, events like that have occurred. So there's a dynamic relationship between the two, much more so than, let's say, the presence of Protestantism and Catholicism in France since the rise of Protestantism, where the, from the time of Huguenots down, you have a small French a Protestant minority, and that's more or less permanent vis-à-vis -vis the uh, Catholic majority. So it's a very important thing to understand, and that will determine to a large extent the dynamic of the relationship between the two in the future, as well as what happened in the past. Now I would claim that uh, the two subjects which are the mo greatest important, the, the two most important subjects or problems facing the Islamic world today and indirectly the rest of the world has been, as is affected by these two some, uh, some themes or two subjects. One of them is, of course, the interaction between the Islamic world and the West, and modernism, into which I will not go. The second is the relationship between Sunnism and Shiism within the Islamic world. This would not have been so important politically had not the West discovered it as a very uh, important means of manipulating the situation in the Islamic world. If you read the history 
of British colonialism going back to the 19th century and the manipulation of Sunni Shiite differences, uh, you will see how this has such a long, long history. And what is going on in Iraq right now uh, has a history that goes back a long time and which is not all to be put at the foot of the Muslims themselves. The Muslims gave a wonderful excuse for those who wanted to dominate over them to make, take advantage of the, what would appear to be a racism between the two communities. And then to read backwards, which is totally false. Today, there's no country where as many Sunnis and Shiites are being killed as in Pakistan, killing each other, except for Iraq, which is Al-Qaeda, is doing it because Wahhabism is based actually on the hatred of Shiism and Sun Sufism, that's its found, ideological foundation. But putting Iraq aside, there's no country like Pakistan. And people say it was always like that, which is totally false. The founder of Pakistan, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, whose picture hangs in every uh, office uh, in Pakistan, whether you're in Lahore, Karachi, or Islam, or anywhere else, was of course the Atta Ashiri Shia, the 12 Imam Shia. And so was the first prime minister of Pakistan, Yagat Ali Khan. And nobody ever thought of this uh, uh, question at all, uh, 40, 50 years ago. The very first uh, Iran ambassador to Pakistan was my uncle, uh, Said Ali Nasr. And uh, when uh, Jinnah and people like to come to Iran, they used to stay, stay in our family home. And some of them bring Sunni ministers. Nobody said, are you a Sunni or a Shiite? They would all eat the same dining room. Nobody even talked about these matters. This is not something which had deep historical roots, but it, the schism provided the excuse for what we see today that is the most powerful force for having Muslims at each other's throat. And now you see the worst example of it in Syria, uh, which is something of one of the greatest tragedies of our, our times. I don't know who's making plans for these tragedies, but whatever it is, it's an absolute suicide. You will see one day what I say tonight for the people in the West who are behind the scene and not to talk of the poor Syrian people. But again, there is a question of Alawis and Sunnis and Wahhabis and Salafis and so forth and so on, right to the fore, whereas in fact this was not the case in Syria all the time. At all, for centuries, Sunnis and Shiites lived together in Lebanon in the same way. Uh, you, I know these 500 families, Arab families, where the husband is Sunni, the wife is Shiite, or the husband is Shiite, the wife is Sunni, and so on and so on. No, nobody even thought of it. This division that you see before you now. So you, the situation, this question, becomes now of paramount importance. Not only because of itself, but because of its manipulation by global powers, as no other force is manipulated within the Islamic world as no other forces manipulate. So let's try to understand it a little bit. And let's just, I said, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, let's begin with yesterday. The great uh, British historian who taught at Harvard for a long time, Sir Hamilton Gibb, probably the greatest English-speaking historian that this part of the world ever produced of Islamic history, once said, that everything in Islamic history to our own day, that was in the 1950s when he said it, had been determined by the Battle of Safin. Everything is an outcome of the Battle of Safin. Let me just start with this <coughs> famous statement made by Western Orientals, not by a Muslim scholar, but I think quite a cogent observation. Uh, I don't want to go into the details of uh, how the Battle of Safin came about, but after, very quickly, after the death of the Prophet, Abu Bakr became the first Caliph. A small number of people thought that Ali should have become Caliph. But Ali himself accepted Abu Bakr and was consulted by him. And what a lot of modern Shiites say, it's not true. Some preachers go and say, uh, curse Abu Bakr. Uh, this is actually not at all historical. It's the, the, the other side of the coin of the uh, Wahhabis calling the Shiites uh, Rahadi or something like that. Uh, and then two other caliphs came, uh, of course, Omar and Uthman, and then Ali himself, who the Shiites considered should have been succeeded, the Prophet became caliph, but that this fourth caliph was not accepted by one of the relatives of the third caliph, Uthman, who was a very, very shrewd and very remarkable relief, uh, military leader, Muawiyah, Muawiyah, who was then governor of 
Damascus of Syria, and uh, Ali, in order to establish his rule over the whole Islamic world, fought the Battle of Safin and the battleground between present day Syria and Iraq uh, uh, against Muawiyah. And uh, that was a determining battle because all the Ali's army had won. Uh, Muawiyah used the ruse, a uh, trick, and had his army come out with Qurans on their lashes and said, Let the Quran decide between us. And so Ali accepted. And uh, I say, always jokingly, Muawiyah sent Ch Winston Churchill as arbitrator, and Ali sent a saint to the, uh, from his side, Ash al Ashari. And of course, the Ali's side lost, and a number of Muslims believed that this was not the way to go, and they assassinated Ali, and they wanted to assassinate Muawiyah, but Muawiyah didn't die. He was, had a cold that day, he didn't go. So this determined the whole course of Islamic history. The Caliphate, uh, the Rashidun came to an end, the new type of caliphate was hereditary and there was a kind of Islamic kingship began, was never accepted by Shiites and it lasted of course for uh, seven centuries until the Mongol invasion and uh, then other forms of government came to power. So the origin of Sunnah Shiite contention also had a political dimension from the very beginning. But it was not only political, that's one of the things that must be understood if we're going to understand more deeply what is going on today, what will go on tomorrow. Uh, many, you read almost every book, that the di division between the Sunnis and Shias came about on the question of who should succeed the Prophet. That's not at all the case. The division was what are the qualifications of the person who's supposed to succeed the Prophet? That's the question, whether they differ. The Sunnis believe that the Prophet has, has come to an end. The person who succeeds the Prophet must fulfill his functions as the ruler of the Islamic community. To guard the borders, to preserve the law, to preserve peace. This is in all classical works of Sunni political theory, going back to al mawardi and all the early sources. Whereas the Shiites believe that he had to have both knowledge and had to be inerrant, masum, he had to be sinless, a condition which is not fulfilled by ordinary human beings. All of us have been touched by the wing of sin, uh, as they say. Uh, so this was a very different conception of who should succeed the Prophet. The, uh, of course, the Sunnis agreed with Shiites that all Prophets were inerrant. But as to cause why they were in error, there were some different theological differences that I'm not going into now. It's a very complicated matter, it's not for this lecture. But it was very important that uh, the Sunnis did not connect this attribute with the successors of the Prophet. In fact, the Caliphs were not even supposed to be great experts in Islamic law. That's why the power of the ulama remained independent of that of the Caliphate. Whereas the Shiites believed that he who rules of the Islamic a community should be masson, at the same time should be learned in law and he should be learned in the inner sciences, in the esoteric sciences, and the spiritual sciences. And so uh, two different conceptions were there at the beginning. It was not a question whether a person's name should be Abu Bakr or Ali. That's incidental to the conditions set for being the leader of the Islamic community. And the term itself was used in the term leader in very different ways. Uh, the Muslims in general use the term leader, uh, the Arabic word imam, which means comes from amama in Arabic, which means to stand before, to stand in front of, and you honor the word imam, like imams of mosques in Hartford and so forth. But in Shiism, it came to have a very special meaning of being related to this function of being the ideal ruler of the Islamic community which was fulfilled only once during this five and a half year caliphate of Ali, and which will not come about until the appearance of the 12th Imam, the Mahdi. It's the view of 12th Imam Shiism. Ismailis believe that their Imams continued on earth and came out of underground, set, not Ghaibat. They were not occulted by the 12th Imam, but they were hidden from view, and they come out with the Fatimids in Egypt and, and Tunisia, and they ruled for two and a half centuries, and they're still around. But the 12 Imam Shiites believe that that ideal rule occurred only once for a few years and will not occur again. Every form of government is 
actually imperfect. This is one of the major theological problems discussed in Iran today. This is one of the very, very major theological problems. The great ulama of Iran have discussed this as an issue which Ayatollah Khomeini had to address when he brought out the doctrine of the Balayat uh, al which is, all of which is the consequence of this way of looking at, at government, except the new interpretation of it, which had not existed earlier in Shiite history. Anyway, to cut the story short, uh, from this difference of view of who the ruler should be, developed uh, the majority community, which put the quality of inerrancy in the community itself. There is no religion which does not have a criterion for the protection of the truth. It's like Catholicism, when they talk about the ineffability of the Pope, when he speaks as cathedra, uh, of the traditional Catholics believe in this. Now, everyone says everything doesn't matter anymore, but for centuries, uh, in Hinduism is the same way, Buddhism is the same way. In every religion, there must be some guarantee of authenticity and inerrancy of religious authority. Now, the question which few people have addressed is how did the, the Sunni solve this? The Sunni solve this on the basis of the Hadith of the Prophet that my community shall never agree upon error. So Sunnah by Jama'ah, the word Jama'ah, which implies majority, community, goes back to this. That is, God guaranteed that the Islamic community as a whole would never agree on error. There would be errors here and there, but not the community as a whole. So for the Shias, this inerrancy resided in the leader. For the Sunnis, it resided in the community. But the idea was always there. There's an, I'd say there's, you will not find any single religion that survives historically without some kind of guarantee of inerrancy, of continuation of authority that's authentic. Otherwise, you're to just transform itself too quickly and nothing will be left of it, obviously. Anyway, on the basis of this, the dynamics of early Islamic history took place. Uh, I cannot give you its history, but the Umayyads were very, very much against the family of Ali. Uh, and as you know, just a few days ago, coincided with the death of the son of Ali, Hussein ibn Ali, in Karbala, which was, I was astounded to see was celebrated by 100,000 Nigerians for the first time. I was absolutely astounded. There wasn't a single Shiite in Nigeria in the 1950s. I don't know where they came from, but it's in, uh, in Egypt, of course. I've come not to talk about Iran and uh, uh, Pakistan and India. And, you know, the biggest. Uh, operatic theater center in the world is in Lucknow, uh, where they had the Tazia, the traditional Tazia, related mostly to the death of Hussein, occurring in the year 61 of the Hijra of the Margaret the Prophet, which in a sense crystallized, crystallized more than any other event. Uh, the opposition of the Umayyads, the family of Ali, and the opposition of the followers of Ali to the Umayyads. And then other, there were other uprisings, the Mukhtar, others, and finally led to the demise of the Umayyads with the help of people who had Shiite proclivity. Although they did not choose a Shiite Imam, they went first to Imam Jafar al-Sadr, the sixth Shiite Imam, who was residing in Medina. He refused to accept the Caliphate. But in a very famous sentence, he said, uh, This campaign is not our campaign, this time is not our time. And he, he rejected that. They went to one of the uh, cousin of the Abbasid uh, branch and they chose one of them, Safin, who became the founder of the Abbasid Caliphate, the second major caliphate, which was more pro Shiite, not completely pro Shiite, but less anti Shiite, than you put it, than the Umayyads. And gradually, Shiism developed, and by the third and fourth Islamic century, it became a major force. Now, very different from the situation in Iran today. Many Iranians, especially nationalists, make the great mistake of thinking that Shiism is a kind of part of the Iranian character, Iranian invention. It's all total nonsense from a point of, of uh, scholarship. I've been castigated directly in Tehran for saying this, but I will say nevertheless. Because at that time, Iran was solidly Sunni. 
The center of Sunnism was Khorasan. That's where all the great ulama, muhaddithun, scholars of hadith, Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, they all came from the region of what is today Iran, Afghanistan, or Central Asia, and those areas are Qazvin, which is a little bit this wide within Iran. Not one of the great scholars of hadith was an Arab. They all came from this region of Khorasan. They were all Sunnis. So, uh, and many of the scholars of Tafsir, Tabari, and so forth and so on. So it wasn't that uh, Persians were Shiites, Arabs were Sunnis. This is to totally false. In the fourth century, when we looked at the map, it was very different. Syria and Egypt were the centers of Shiism, and to some extent, Yemen, where the center of Sunnism was Persia. And these peripheral regions, faraway regions, there was a mixture in, in some kind of India as Islam was then spreading and gradually into India. It was the beginning of the spread of Islam. And in North Africa, there was very little presence of Shiism, except in lo local conditions that arose once or twice in Iberia and in Tunisia, but they're minor. So the influence of Shiism and interplay with Sunnism was in the central region of the Islamic world between Egypt and the Punjab, as I already said. But not the way we look at it today. Uh, as I said, Persia was almost solidly Sunni. In the whole province of Khorasan, the great Khorasan, which embraces present-day Persia and Khorasan, western Afghanistan, and southern Central Asia, that great Khorasan going all over to Samarkand and Bukhara. They said only the city of Samar uh, Sabzabar was majority shared. Once town. Neshawur, Tus, all these great classical cities, they were, they were completely Sunni, maybe a few Shias living here and there. But it wasn't like what we have today. So this continued to the uh, Mongol period. The Mongol invasion destroyed the power, the political power of Sunnism. Polaku killed the last Abbasid Caliph, and the institution of the Caliphate came to an end. And the second important step that took place but the grandson of Polakko, Ojai II, uh, embraced Islam but in its 12 Shiite form. He formed a conference in Western Iran to which he invited Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians, and Muslims, both Sunni and Shiite, to discuss their own religion. And so, I listen to all of your arguments. I will choose whatever is most pleasing to me. And Allah Mahilli, a student of Nasiruddin Tusi, Presented the Holy Imam Shiite side, and Ojai II became sort of Muhammad and became Shiite. So uh, that caused changes gradually to take place. And also the Sufi orders played a very, very important role in this intermittent stage in which uh, central authority had been destroyed by the Mongol invasion, many institutions had been destroyed, and the Sufi orders were offered a bridge, not always, not always, offered a bridge between Sunnism and Shiism. Some of them were staunchly anti-Shiite, like the Nashmandiya, were Persian, but anti-Shiite came later. Others, like the Chishtis, played a very important role, uh, and especially the Nurbakshi order uh, of, uh, as a bridge between the two. Anyway, uh, gradually, the situation began to change in the 13th century as a result of these monumental uh, events that took place, and then the Ottomans, Hanafis, established a powerful uh, empire, the Ottoman Empire, and incorporated a large number of Shiites. And there they had no problem with the Shiite population until a number of Turks, not Persian Shiites, in the Eastern Anatolian region and Caucasia began to rise against the, the Hanafi Sunnis of the Ottoman Empire. And there were the Ghazalbash, and with the, uh, the members of the Safavi order, Sufi order, following Shah Safiuddin Arbibili, who was buried in Arbibili, this beautiful city in Iran next to the Caspian Sea, and the founder of the <coughs> Sufi order, and uh, as both the Sufi order and Shia Sufi order took over Persia. Shah Ismail was only 13 years old, and the horseback, and that's nominally head, at the head of the army, the captured Tabriz, and after they captured the whole of Persia, and we got two powerful empires. The Ottomans, the most powerful empire in the world at that time, they were Sunni, and they, uh, the Safavis, to a large extent, in order to protect Iran from the Turks, adopted Shiism as the official religion of the country. The first time they saw Islam. 900 years after the founding of Islam, Shiism became the official religion of Persia, and within a 50-year period, it was 
the two sides sort of uh, one side pressed uh, it's Shiite population, one side is Sunni population, some migrated, some were killed and fought, all kinds of things took place. But within a century, the Shiites of Turkey have gone underground as Alawis. The Alawis are present in Turkey. Major problem for Turkey. And, uh, people don't talk about it very much now because of the Kurdish problem. That's another major problem. They were the remnants of the Shiites of Turkey, of uh, the Ottoman world after the Soviets came to power. And in Persia, some of the uh, leading Sunni thinkers migrated to India. They just left. Others uh, became Shiite, others remain. 10% of Persia is Sunni today, 90% is Shiite. So the whole dynamic changed, and the Arab countries also, the dynamic changed somewhat. Iraq, which had been part of the Persian Empire, was taken over by the Ottomans, and the Iranians were never able to recapture it politically, but it was uh, religiously Shiite and remained the center of Shiite learning. Najaf remained the center of Shiite learning, and it does so today. Before the Americans invaded Iraq, uh, I don't want to say who, but very many authorities in this country called me and asked me about the question of Shiism and Sunnism in Iraq. I was astounded that no one who was making decisions about the lives of millions of people had the foggiest idea of the religious structure of Iraq. Nothing, nothing, no, nothing at all. So my knowledge of uh, uh, Swahili literature was about the same, this is the same level. Absolutely, practically nothing. Well, that's uh, I said that ignorance is bad. But there's one thing worse than ignorance. That's applied ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> the same way that applied science causes pollution, science itself doesn't do it. Applied ignorance is really the worst of all things. But anyway, uh, we had this dynamic within several Arab countries. Uh, Yemen, half Sunni, half Shiite. Iraq, majority Shiite, but not ruled by Sunnis. And this will continue until Saddam Hussein. And the fall of Saddam Hussein meant the undoing of four centuries of repression of the majority. <coughs> with all the zillions of dollars being spent with all the think tanks in Washington, why weren't people aware of this? Why were, I mean, what is going on? Why, why are we so ignorant? This intentional ignorance is the worst thing in the world. And it's terrible when you happen to know something, you really suffer. Happy are the ignorant to walk through life, you know, and it's me walking like that. They don't know what's going on. But when you really know what's going on, it's very, very painful, extremely painful. And I've had the reverse honor of being in this position many times in my life, and I still am, as I stand here right before you now. I can see like they are like what's going to happen in Syria. And everybody is just going headlong into a major catastrophe, all the way from Turkey to Jordan and to the United States. The United States, the only country that might benefit would be Israel, and not even that I'm not sure of. But till they have a, a, a Al Qaeda state in the north instead of the Ba'ath Party, we'll see what will happen. Uh, well, anyway, let me get to that part next time. So, and then you have the vast uh, part of the Islamic world in India, that is Indian Islam, in which from the very beginning is a remarkable presence of both Sunnism and Shiism. Majority Sunni, but very large Shiite minorities. The Mughals established a great empire in the north. It's Sunni, it's Hanafi, the Bahmanids in Dakan, which is 12 Imam Shiite, and the, the Mughal never able to take over the Bahmanis. In many of the cities, Lahore, and the Gujarat, uh, Sindh, they always the, both populations. And the dynamic of relationship between Sunnism and Shiism in India and Pakistan itself is a very, very interesting story. Very interesting story. Much less so in what became East Pakistan later on to the Bangladesh. There weren't many Shiites there. So the dynamic between Sunnism and Shiism plays out in history in a very, very complicated manner over a vast area, but excluding the two extremities of the Islamic world, geographically speaking. That is, uh, Shiism is not consequential in <coughs> Southeast Asia, in the Malay world. It's only beginning now. In Malaysia, it's completely banned. The government has banned any talk of Shiism. If Amr Ibrahim comes to power, it's going to change, but for the moment, that's the situation. 
uh, a lot of contacts with the students of mine and our major professors in Malaysia have a lot of contact with them. Government is very, very sensitive to this. But in Indonesia, as soon as the dictatorship fell, the doors opened. There's now a major Shiite community in Jakarta and Jakarta itself. So there is some Shiite presence, but it's very small, very minor, kind of 200 million people here, 200,000 Shiites, so what? It's a very small minority. And at the other end of the Islamic world, from Tripoli or even Benghazi West, uh, Shiism does not play a role. Satan, ethos of Shiism in the form of the love of the family of the Prophet, is for example very strong in the Moroccan monarchy, whose kings are descendants of the Prophet. And major Shiite uh, celebrations like Ashura and so forth are held in North Africa as well. But then we have a very, very complicated dynamic which continues to our own day, and which of course began to be affected ever since the 19th century, especially the British agents in the northwestern provinces and uh, in northern India began to sort of play and manipulate with these uh, ideas and forces on the outside. And later on, 20th century, of course, the United States and to some extent Russia was roaming over part of the Islamic world. Now, uh, the, uh, this is the historical part, and of course I don't have time to go uh, into everything, but I want also to say a word to clarify things on the theological relationship between Sunnism and Shiism. Uh, Sunnism and Shiism must not be judged according to what Salafis and Wahhabis write about Sh Shiism today, or about Su Sunnism. Wahhabism and Salafism are not orthodox Sunnism. They're not traditional Sunnism. They are a particular development within traditional Sunnism. In fact, there is very little in English of traditional Sunnism. It's a very, very strange thing. And the old people used to complain there's nothing about Shiism. The first serious book ever to come out about Shiism was a book which was commissioned in Iran by an American scholar. Uh, Kenneth Crack, uh, to, for Allah Ta'ala Tawai, I wanted me to supervise the right, the famous book, Shia Dar Islam, which became Shia Dar Islam, is still taught in many universities, we published many times, and all my translated myself into English under Allah's direction, that what he didn't know in English, but the Persian that he had written. Uh, we were all complaining, now there are more books on Shiism than on Sunnism. If I want to assign a book to my students, to, to read about traditional Sunnism from its own point of view. Where do I go? There are books of Orientalists, and there are a lot of books written by either Salafis or Modernists, or oh, there's a whole library, a whole ship full of books written by them. But that's not traditional Sunnism. Uh, that's a very, very important point to realize. What I'm interested in is in the relation between traditional Sunnism and Shiism. The similarity between two perspectives is much greater, much, much greater, than the similarity between Protestant and Catholic Christianity. Much, much greater. First of all, the three fundamental principles of Islam, Tawheed, Nabobwa, Ma'ad, that is unity, the unity of God, the institution of prophecy, the fact that prophethood, that the message comes from God, and Ma'ad, eschatology, or our return back to God, which also determines our life in this world, our moral actions, the consequence of how we live, and all of those are incorporated in that, are held together between Sunni and Shiites. There's no doubt about that. It is a cardinal to all to both. The question of divine justice. Most Sunnis interpret as being sort of extrinsic to God. The Shiites has been intrinsic to the divine nature. That is, uh, the word rest or adl, which in Arabic means justice, is considered by many great Sunni theologians as being a name of God. Many Shia theologians they say God is not only just, he is justice. That is, justice is identified with divine nature. Now, that's a very subtle metaphysical and theological uh, difference, but nevertheless, I'm trying to point out there are some differences. The question of uh, the Sharia, 90% of 
of all, more than 95% of all the ahkam in judge of the Sharia are shared by Sunnis and Shiites. I mean, the major uh, uh, acts of uh, daily prayers, fasting, the ritual acts, uh, Hajj, and so forth, are the same. There are small differences, which are no more than differences between various schools of Sunni law. But if somebody says, oh, you Shiites say the prayers are standing like that rather than like this, my mother or father used to stand like this. Let me take a play for you and take you to Casablanca where everybody is Maliki and they stand like this. Uh, so it's, uh, different. there are some small differences, but they're no greater. Uh, a question of inheritance, things like that, there are very small differences that are technical. But by and large, the general uh, understanding of the divine law, uh, how it works in everyday life, and the principles of, of the religion, the Usul al and the Fur al are very, very close. There is the question of law one major difference. For Sunnism, the ijtihad that is giving fresh view on matters of law based on the principles of law came to an end about a thousand years ago. It's so-called the gate of ijtihad was closed and many reformers, so-called what are called deformers in the Islamic world have tried to open up its door during the last century. So Sayyid Ahmad Khan already spoke about it in the 1850s, 60s and since then many, many other people. In Shia Islam, there must always be a living mujtahid in order for the integration of Islamic law to be accepted. It's at the very other extreme. That you have to follow a living mujtahid. So the gate of Ishtahat has always been open. And it's one of the points that many of the most influential and profound Sunni juridical thinkers of the last century have tried to study and try to apply to Sunnism. So there's also a lot of interaction going on between them. Where the difference comes, the major difference, is this question of authority and authority over what. Uh, if you add Sufism, Sunni Sufism, and Shariite or theological Sufism, it's very close to the Shariite position. But the ordinary Sunni position speaks of Nabova the Prophet, and then the function of the Khulafa, his successors or his vice-chairs, who do not share in either the power of spiritual direction or interpretation of the law or anything like that. They're supposed to be ruled of society according to the law. The function of the Caliph is not to, make, to interpret the law. He might be a fabi on the side. It's to promulgate the law. as interpreted by the ulama. Now, for, for Shiites, uh, as I said, there's also in addition to the power of Nabobba, power of Walaya, this word which is very, very difficult to translate into English, which can be pronounced as Walaya and Wilaya, both of them are correct. They come from two Arabic, different Arabic words. I don't want to get into the semantics here, but it could be called the power of initiation, the power of guidance, uh, the, uh, all kinds of things. And the term that was coined by Ayatollah Khomeini, Velayat al-Faqih, the rule of the jurisprudence, which is the foundation of the present day Iran, comes from that word, of course. But it has m much greater meaning, as to do with the word balaya, which means sainthood also in, in Islam. And uh, awliya, the saints of God, as the Quran says. It's a very, very rich term. But the power, the function of balaya must always be present also once Nobobah comes to an end. It is not true, as some people have said, that the Shias do not believe that the Prophet was the last Prophet. It's not that they the Muslims. They believe it was Khatam al-Anbiya, the Quran says so. But they believe that after the Prophet, the power of Nobobah came to an end, but the power of Walaya continued, and continues today, and will continue to the end of the world. There is no temporal end to the power of Walaya. Which, uh, and has many, many levels of meaning. Which means, first of all, that there will always be a witness on earth of God's presence. There will be a hujja, a sign of God always present. That this power of guidance will always be there. It will never be terminated. That God will never, through his mercy, bring this to an end. There are many, many other things that follow from it. Now, 
Uh, one last point we don't distinguish with Sunnism and Shiism, at least not, uh, not all schools of Sunnism, but the Asharite school, which became the most popular, is the function of aql, of the intellect. Now, both Sunnism and Shiism, of course, emphasize aql. The Quran keeps emphasizing the importance of aql, which means intellect and not only reason. And it uses a verb form of it times in Arabic, which we have lost in English. I've tried to revive the 18th century use of the term to intellect. To intellect, which is English, it's very eloquent English, it's used in Shakespeare and so forth, but Shakespearean times. I don't remember whether Shakespeare said it was it or not, but anyway, uh, the Quran uses it, Ya'aqaloon, La Ya'aqaloon, and so forth, and uses it in a verbal form, non noun form. And so, of course, all of us will believe in Aql. Except again, in the Ashraite school, Aql, in a sense, is eclipsed by the will of God. That is, uh, what God wills, that Aql is able to understand as the Ma'bul. Whereas for Shiite Shiism, God cannot not be Ma'bul. That is the nature of God to have Aql. So, Abel comes back to the nature and not to the will of God, in one theological understanding, and to the will uh, in the other. And that has had very profound consequences, and that is the survival of the Islamic intellectual traditions in a much more congenial atmosphere in Shiite Islam than in Sunni Islam. The fact that in the last 400 years, every single major Islamic philosopher has been either a Shiite or Sunni in an ambience like India and some of the Ottoman world, which accepted this shared understanding. And Asharism has not produced a single major thinker of that kind. This has a lot to do with Islamic history to which I will not go. Now, uh, my time is running out, and I have so many very sensitive things to say, but some actually would probably should not be said at all, but I will say it nevertheless. <laughs> One of the good uh, other advantages of old days is you can say whatever you like. Don't uh, worry about not getting promotion next year. <laughs> uh, an event took place which determines the now of the relationship between Sunnism and Shiism. And this event did not take place in Shiism, it took place in Sunnism. It is the rise of the Wahhabi Salafi movement in the 18th century. The original, uh, the origin of this movement was not directly uh, caused by the Western presence in the Islamic world. Wahhabism, uh, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, the founder of Wahhabism, which is the official ideology of Saudi Arabia, uh, came at a time when it was not reacting to the influence of the West. There was no influence of the West in Najda at that time. But all the later history of this movement is related to interaction and response to various forms of, of modernism that were beginning to penetrate into the Islamic world. Wahhabism, from which Sal the Salafism is not the same thing as Wahhabism, but they're interrelated. I don't have time to distinguish them, but they're not the same. Some people make this mistake, many Western scholars do. That's not, they're not the same thing. Salafia movement is a larger movement, but, with, but its origin is very much of a happy point of view. It's based on a kind of puritanical, rationalistic interpretation of Islam. Uh, it's, uh, as I said, its position is defined by its opposition to both Sunnism and Shiism. All the tombs of the saints of northern Mali which were destroyed last month, raised to the ground, some a thousand years old. The sign of this, the sign of this, this is the Al Qaeda inspired Wahhabi uh, Salafi movement in northern Mali, which inshallah the other African country will go and swoop into the sea very soon. But it's destroyed already some of the most important Sufi monuments in North Africa. And uh, back east, with the tremendous power of the Ottomans. They put them down, they, killed all, they tried to kill all, all the Wahhabis when they invaded uh, Saudi Arabia at that time, it was not called Saudi. But then they fled into Najd and rose again. And they came north, and in 1810, 
For just a few days, they captured Karbala and they killed 10,000 Shiites. They massacred 10,000 people in just four days. So the, back, the ideological background is extreme opposition to those interpretations of Islam which have any mystical or intellectual content. Intellectual content. And so this has created a situation which affects very much the present relationship between Sunnism and Shiism. There, there's no parallel movement in Shiism related today to this. Right now, Saudi Arabia is spending millions of dollars indirectly in trying to create a Shiite Salafism in southern Iran, among the Baluch, and even among Shiites. There's a new wave of a kind of Shiite Salafism, if I can call it, as a contradiction in terms. But it's to be seen several places. You know, we'll buy uh, uh, people off or weak in spirit. But it's going on to this extent, uh, which is really a catastrophe. But this, uh, this element con uh, concerns very much the relationship between Sunnism and Shiism today. And if you want to know how paranoid this situation is, the greatest quantitatively transfer of technology in human history took place from the 1970s to the 1980s from the United States to Saudi Arabia. Most extensive transfer of technology in human history took place during that decade. The Saudis are lovers of machines and of gadgets. I don't mean every Saudi, but I mean the, the milieu that runs the show. Uh, any kind of gadget you can sell to the Saudis is very easy. They so just made, made the building bigger than the Empire State, right next to the Kaaba. I mean, can you imagine if they turned the Kaaba, suffer a lot, into a nightclub, it would have been less worse. Uh, it was just unbelievable, really unbelievable. And all of these things go on. So they're great lovers of modern technology. But they hate Apple. They hate philosophy. I will just tell you the story. In 1983, the Saudis decided to create a history of science museum in Saudi Arabia. They came to see me. I was living in Boston. We met at Harvard with some Saudis who had come. And they said, you're the great authority on Islamic science. We want you to guide this. I said that the Science Museum is a very important cultural statement. It can be devastating culturally. It's not just neutral. And I'll do it for you, provided you listen to, listen to what I say. I said, no, no, whatever you say, we'll do. So I went to Saudi Arabia, and I was giving a talk to the Minister of Higher Education, Minister of this, Minister of that, his of the 20, 30 people. I was talking to them. At that very moment, my book, Islamic Science and Illustrated Study, which had been translated into Arabic, Our Look for Islam, uh, was being carried by one of my students uh, back to Saudi Arabia, and he was arrested at the uh, frontier because he had this book with him. Because the book contained a chapter on Islamic philosophy. It was not only about science. That is not enough intelligence to understand that Western technology relies on Western science, Western science is really a particular philosophical view of the world. And in a vacuum, you cannot create either Western science or te Western technology without Western science. Uh, that, uh, you can only buy junk, which is the best thing to do. You, uh, you get the money from the oil and you, you collect it and uh, send junk back, which is what we've been doing the last 50 years anyway. <laughs> I said, since I'm not going to get promoted next year, I've made my last trip. <laughs> I've made my last trip to the Hajj, so I've not worried. I've not given me a visa. I've made many trips. That's the end of it. I feel like I'm on duty uh, as a person who's been involved with these things on both practical and theoretical views, uh, levels of so many decades to, to bring out these salient features. To want a completely technological modern society without any reference to app, to intelligence, and to ph philosophical thinking in general, I don't mean a particular school of philosophy, to thinking, to thinking is really a great either paradox or hypocrisy, I don't know which one to name it. But that's the situation. And that affects today the dynamics between Iran as a Shiite country and Saudi Arabia that are leading the standard of sort of Sunni opposition to Iran. They're playing this card very strongly. And they're the ones who finally come to the United States.
to side with them against making peace with Iran. I don't want to talk, talk a personal matter, but I have a son who's known as Badinas. He wrote a book called the Shia Revival, which is based on the idea that there's a whole arc uh, uh, of Shia influence from Lebanon all the way to uh, Iran. And it's very important for the United States to try to understand this and try to come with turn with it rather than just relying on Egypt and Saudi Arabia as staunch so many countries against this. And uh, he was invited to the White House, President Bush wrote my letters, and I've read your book and so on and so on, but unfortunately nobody listened. And uh, that was just put on the side completely. And of course Mubarak fell, and one of the staunch uh, supporters went, and the other one remains. But this way of looking at things affects very much the relation between Sunnism and Shiism itself, and it's not to be overlooked. There's so many other things I could say about uh, this, these matters, but I shan't. I want to talk a few minutes about when my time is up about tomorrow. Uh, <coughs> in contrast to what we read in the Western press, and we hear on CNN 24 hours a day, uh, it's not true that Sunnism and Shiism either have been or are always at each other's throat. That is not true, even politically. Even politically. The Hamas is not a Shiite organization. It's Sunni. There are no Shiites in Palestine. But it's good friends politically with Iran. So it's not always a one block here, one block there. Egyptians are all Shafi's, but they're probably more pro Shiite than uh, any other country because of their history. They call themselves Shiite al Farah, uh, the Shiite of happiness, rather than we are called Shiite al Hus because we cry all the time for that <laughs> answer. Uh, Egyptians are my own country, is a country that I love, and people are very close to Persia. So it's, it's not that simple. But uh, there are both forces for division and for rapprochement in the Islamic world as far as Sunnism and Shiism are concerned. It's not that people are always at each other's throat. Let me clarify this for you. About 50 years ago, when Jamal Abdel Nasser came to power, he realized that uh, Shafi'i, that is uh, Sunni law in Egypt, this particular school of law that's followed in Egypt, Shafi'i law, uh, like most other Sunni law, limits inheritance uh, to one's immediate family by also providing inheritance for brothers and sisters and siblings, which is, while modern society is more atomized and the immediate family of descendants are most important. So what to do? Yeah, the committee studied and they realized that in shared law, there's a greater favor given to the immediate family sons and daughters and wife, rather than sisters and brothers. And so Nasser backed, actually, didn't create, but he backed a movement that had begun at al Asa University at that time, at Sheikh al Asr, Sheikh Shatut, uh, to create a, an organization for bringing Sunnism and Shiism together. The Egyptian government supported it. At that time, Iran had good relations with Egypt before the uh, break up of the relations, uh, just the beginning of Nasser's rule. But anyway, Iran also agreed, because soon thereafter, the relations with the kind of severed until Anwar Sadat came to power. And uh, they created Dar al Taqrib in Cairo. And they sent one of the major Iranian scholars from Bom, Artel uh, to uh, Cairo. And they started a journal called Dar al Taqrib, all of which was dedicated to bringing Sunnism and Shiism together. And this was not only beginning, there were other beginnings in Pakistan elsewhere, but it was a very important beginning in the Arab world, especially in Egypt, which is a central Arabic country, intellectually and culturally and religiously. And uh, it went on for some time, despite the curtailment of diplomatic relationships between Iran and Egypt, it went on on its own, and uh, there have been attempts to revive it now. Even, uh, I remember in the 1980s, uh, so many sensitive things about the history of that region that is not enough for public lectures. Even the Saudis realized that uh, they paid us millions of dollars after the Iran Revolution to these Wahhabi ulama to write those terrible books in Arabic against Shiism. If you go to an airport in 1980-81, it was full of these books against Shiism. Severe attacks 
all paid by the Saudi government. <coughs> and uh, the Minister of uh, Interior of Saudi Arabia asked to see me one day. He said, well, we've had a terrible mistake, what do we do? And I said, look, you cannot do anything. Just stand behind the curtain and let there be a, a conference in Egypt to support it from behind the scene. Egypt is an ideal country to try to revive better relationships between Sunnism and Shias. And that was held, and a number of Sunni ulama participated, a number of Shiite ulama. And Iran itself, it's very interesting, in Iran itself, there's never been any uh, contention between Sunnis and Shiites at this time. And uh, even Ayatollah Khamenei sees the Sunni ulama from Kurdistan and Baluchistan and other places where there are uh, Sunnis once a year, and they have their own madrasas, they have their own schools, and so on and so on. And there are a lot of ulama on both sides uh, of the divide who are very much in favor of close relationship between Sunnism and Shiism. Sheikh Ali Jom, the Grand Mufti of Egypt, uh, a very remarkable man and a good friend of mine, he's one of the people who's at the forefront of trying to have a kind of united stand on so many issues, because so many issues that the Islamic world faces, but it has to face in a united way, all the way from the destruction of the climate, the clouds that come full of dust over the Middle East, they don't distinguish between Sunnis and Shiites, <laughs> uh, all the way from that to political matters, to cultural matters, to medical matters, to scientific matters, all of these to try to increase uh, cooperation. But there stands against this uh, very strong interest within the Islamic world for better understanding between uh, Islam and Bethlehem, between Sunnism and Shiism, tremendous forces against this. And then, uh, they're usually paid for by foreign powers or supported indirectly. And at the forefront of this, of course, is Al Qaeda, which makes it a point not only to kill Americans in Afghanistan, but also to kill Shiites, especially Shiites in Iraq and now in Syria, they're inside Syria. And, uh, Qatari money must be wonderful for them, uh, and, uh, or Saudi money who is paying them. Uh, there, are, there are violent forces, violent forces. There are no Shiite militia trying to kill Sunnis. A small group was formed in Iraq, it was very soon disbanded, they wanted to answer the, the attacks against them. But there are these uh, sort of terrorist small groups associated with groups like Al Qaeda or similar groups. Who, who think that they can serve the cause of Islam by creating discord, and by creating discord especially by killing Shiites. So it's a very, very tragic situation. A country like Pakistan and India, which I mentioned to you, was a day when in Lahore you walked, when I was a young professor, I used to go to Lahore every few months. You never asked whether a person was Sunni or Shiite. I used to give lectures to a thousand people in Rasa Punjab. They invited me just a few months ago and they said, you better not come because then someone might put a bomb because they know who you are and you're from Iran. And this, the whole situation changed within one generation. So this is uh, one of the most critical and central issues of the Islamic world and by extension of other parts of the world. Because what will happen in the future relationship between Egypt and Iran, Egypt, Iran, and Turkey, the future of Syria, what will happen if Lebanon explodes again and so forth and so on will affect, of course, everybody. Will affect everybody. And my humble uh, view is that uh, people who play on this division are really playing with fire. Uh, there's a popular folkloric Persian poem that says, A lamp that is light, lit by God, whoever tries to blow it out, only burns his own beard. <laughs> Sunnism and Shiism were built by God. Like every religion has willed to be more than one interpretation in order to protect diversity in its creation. And today they pose both a great challenge and a great opportunity for the Islamic people and also a major problem for them because of the use and misuse of these allegiances that you see before you all the time. Anyway, let me come back to Professor Biesefeld. Uh, this lecture is in his memory. Pray for the, the peace and blessing upon his soul. And uh, what he always had in mind also is to bring about better understanding between Islam and Christianity, and also better understanding of Islam itself, 
this multifarious manifestation and forms. And I hope the humble lecture I've given you tonight will be a small step that will make you so happy in the world beyond. Thank you.